American football is one of the most popular sports, with an average of 17 million people watching per game. Some, however, are concerned about the violence in the sport that has been occurring since the beginning of the game. In the beginning of the progressive era, football was a very new sport. The 1905 football reform occurred and President Theodore Roosevelt saved football forever. In the early years of football, there was a conflict involving the number of deaths and injuries happening within the sport. It was resolved with a compromise when President Theodore Roosevelt took action and the 1905 football reform occurred. Theodore Roosevelt attended his first football game in 1886, Yale vs. Harvard. His passion and involvement in the sport began when he realized that there were no common agreements about many of the basic elements and components of the game. He saw the game as something to improve and modify. As a child, Theodore Roosevelt was afflicted with asthma. This affected his entire life, which is what inspired him as a teenager. He decided that he was going to, quote, make his body, end quote, and he undertook a program of gymnastics and weightlifting, which would help him develop a rugged physique. In the speech that Teddy Roosevelt gave, he said that the chances are strong males won't be good men if they aren't good boys. Quote, he must not be a coward or a weakling, a bully, a shirk, or a prig. He must always work hard and play hard, end quote. This was his outlook on sports. He believed in manliness and that rough sports and living the strenuous life was good for him, as well as the other boys in America for developing character and a healthy body. This is why he felt the strong desire to modify the game of football. Because of Theodore Roosevelt's participation in athletics, he was led to a huge passion for football. His perspective would soon change forever as on October 14, 1905 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Theodore Roosevelt Jr., his son, lay injured on the football field. This opened his eyes to see how players getting injured actually affected families and the sport of football and it led him to see that the game needed to be changed. Football continued on in the way of violence and injury throughout the late 1800s and early 1900s. The sport's rough play was directly tied to its popular appeal. The progressive era began and many people's viewpoints and opinions changed and scenarios and important events were all being seen differently. The public's eyes were open to the violence in football and many disapproved. Many Americans did not see the game of football as we see it today. They believed it was preposterous and that it should be shut out of existence forever. The progressive era would be the start to changing the sport for good, and it was in 1905 that President Theodore Roosevelt would change football forever. Newspapers reported bolded headlines, students killed at football, dead from football injuries, more slugging than playing, and more. Violence was growing within the sport. Plays such as the, quote, flying wedge, end quote, resulting in gruesome injuries when the wall of running players crashed onto their target opponent. There was no padding, and on the head, most wore only a stocking cap for decoration and team identification. The game had become coarse and violent in character. Violence set the sport apart at this time because the American people were unaware of the risks and what could come out of this if they continued on in this pattern of injury and death. It is what made the sport appealing. Theodore Roosevelt had a willpower directed to sports and fitness that allowed him to push through the rough patches in the reform that he learned from the early years of his life. In response to dealing with this conflict, some colleges banned football outright. Harvard intervened twice, once in 1885 and the second time in 1895, in light of the sport's violent nature. Charles W. Eliot, president of Harvard University, spoke on the situation, saying, quote, Many serious injuries occur which are apparently recovered from in good measure, but which are likely to prove a handicap to the victim later in life, end quote. Soon after the concussion crisis began, the conflicts begin to roar. Many players were hitting their heads very hard and receiving issues with brain function and experiencing the long-term effects of being hit through the head, back, and spine. At this time in history, concussions and head injury were studied very little and there was little to no information on them, which resulted in even more possibilities and dangers for permanent life damage to these players. The turn of the 18th century was a time of heightened awareness to injury. The industrializing workplace was a space where accidents constantly occurred, and that triggered a flame in the public's eye to symbolize a need for safety regulations.
Because of this desire to improve safety, it also moved over into the sport of football at the beginning of this new progressive era. This movement is gaining steam. Editorials being written about the evils of football and why it needs to be done away with. So Roosevelt summons to the White House the three coaches from the major football programs, Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. And he says to them, football is on trial and we must save the sport. In the meeting, Teddy addressed and warned that if these coaches would not change the way the game was played, he would ban the sport entirely. He requested that they be the examples for every school across the country, and they came to the agreement to release safety statements to save and change football for the purpose of player safety. A pivotal point in intercollege gate athletics was in the 1905-06 football crisis. Harvard as a school struggled for over half of a year when even considering changing the rules of football. Harvard and Yale experimented for over a year with negotiating rules until reaching a compromise. The first rule that was changed ever in the sport of football was that only kicked balls that sailed between upright poles would count for points. This was monumental because they began to present this idea to the other schools, and some even accepted them, such as Columbia. Princeton had a player get injured on the field. Little did America know this was just foreshadowing what was to come for football violence. Big men pushed and shoved their way through and around piles of bodies that crashed and fought for the ball without benefit of protective gear and equipment. Back in the early days of football, nobody wore protective gear such as masks, shoulder pads, or mouth guards. During pileups hidden from the views of referees, players would wrestle for the advantage of receiving the football by throwing punches and jabbing elbows. All of the minor injuries such as sprains and bruises were ignored for the sake of commercialism and the toughness of the brutal sport. Football began to prove its place in American culture during Roosevelt's life. Teddy Roosevelt stood out from previous presidential athletes because not only was he an athlete that played sports himself, but he felt compelled to change the nation's athletic activities. Teddy believed in athletic games not primarily for profit or namesake, but he personally believed that sports were to execute positive physical and character development. Roosevelt believed in tests of endurance and strength and believed in mastery of pain. Quote, I believe in athletic sports, end quote. He believed in vigorous outdoor games and participating, which is where his love for football came in. All the voters were asked, like it says, quote, while the October 9th pledge was a much needed step toward progress, it alone was not enough to deter Elliot from his quest to end football at Harvard. In a late October meeting, Elliot convinced the Harvard Corporation to take a vote on the future of the school's football program, and once the results were tallied, it was decided that Harvard football would be canceled. All voters were asked to keep the result of the balloting quiet so that Elliot could announce it at a later date. However, Coach Reed heard about the vote and then hurried to a local newspaper to put together a letter which was published the next day in newspapers nationwide. The letter announced that Harvard's football coach would establish a committee to make radical changes in football. This was huge because without this taking of action, football might have never continued. Jumping over to an important influence in the modification of football was a speech written by Theodore Roosevelt entitled, The Strenuous Life. His goal and purpose in presenting this speech to the general public was to teach the people that they must work hard to overcome difficulties to be able to achieve improvement and reach success in careers and in the world. Teddy passionately believed in hard work and he constantly emphasized that his life would be a strenuous life, but that their efforts would pay off. This speech is a big motivating factor in the big 1905 football reform. It shows the passion behind Theodore Roosevelt and why he continued to make the decisions that he did. Between the violence and major arguments in the early 1900s, there was a compromise when President Theodore Roosevelt took action and told all of the coaches that they needed to make a change to their teams and to the sport. He used his background and passion for a strenuous life to influence a conflict that would eventually lead into a compromise for the greater good of sports programs, athletes, and people in America. This was the 1905 football reform.